Greetings and welcome, all. Uh, thanks for coming down to Long McQuaid Edmonton Mayfield. This is the first band clinic, band department related clinic that we've had at this location since we moved from downtown. Very excited. It's a flute player, uh, a flute clinic, uh, given that I am a flute player. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we're super excited to welcome Bill McBurney here. Um, Bill is very talkative has lots of stories to tell, so you're gonna to get to know him pretty well, I think, over the course of this clinic. But I'll give you a quick uh, background from his website. Uh, Bill McBurney has achieved something decidedly unlikely for a Canadian flute player raised in the small port town, or sorry, small town of Port Colborne, Ontario. Despite a rather unremarkable musical beginning, he has succeeded in attaining an international standing as one of today's foremost jazz flutists, all while rarely setting foot outside of his native city of Toronto, Ontario. What has made a slow but steady progress possible has been a long and diligent study of both jazz and classical techniques, which Bill combined with a patient determination to make the flute sound natural and convincing in non-classical contexts. Bill's long-standing commitments to the instrument has earned him consistently unequivocal acclaim and awards, both here and uh, both here in Canada and abroad, including Flutist of the Year uh, from Jazz Report Awards. A uh, triple crown winner in all three of the Jazz Flute Soloist, Masterclass, and Big Band competitions from the National Flute Association in the USA, Best Jazz Album from Toronto Independent Music Awards, and nomination for Best Jazz Album from the Independent Music Awards in the USA. Uh, as a testimony to his noteworthy place in the international flute community, Bill was solicited personally by the esteemed classical flutist Sir James Galway to serve as his resident jazz flute specialist at Sir James' official website. And you will see, uh, if you take a look in Bill's book, that there is a lovely foreword from uh, Sir James uh, at the beginning there. So that's all from me. I'm very grateful all of you have shown up. I'll hand over the floor to Bill. So please welcome Bill McBurney. <laughs> Okay, so where do we begin? I guess at that point when we start, which is about now. So um, there's any number of ways of going about this, but what I might do first is just, um, I used to ask this question when I was doing clinics at the National Flute Association in the States. Um, how many of you are flute players? Okay, I used to characterize it as a trick question. Um, <laughs> But this is a little more open-ended because I actually, uh, I'm interested in improvising and you can improvise on any instrument. So a lot of what I say applies to any instrumentalist. Um, but uh, how many of you play other instruments? And, um, and how many of you improvise? Also a fair number, okay, all right. Okay, um, probably the best thing to do to start is just for me to play something for you and let you listen to that. You've got a one sheet handout, which is basically the top tier of the table of contents of, of the book I finally wrote. Sir James Galloway was asking me to do this for 15 years and I finally got around to it. Um, so that outlines the the basic content of the book and gives you some idea of how it's organized. That can prompt some questions, but also if I play, I think that should prompt some questions. So like think of what I might be doing or what's going on and don't hesitate to ask because I have no secrets. And I've learned that as a student from time to time that people that make it a little mysterious, they're not doing you a service, a good service. Uh, the best teachers are often the ones that are very plain spoken and keeping it to like nuts and bolts almost. Um, I, I can't do anything about your soul. You have to work that yourself into the music, but there are a lot of other things that you can do to enable yourself to play in a meaningful way. And that's the kind of thing we'll look at today. You see, I, oops, that's, I don't think that's the track. Maybe I'll just play this one. Um, one thing I decided was that I'd, I'd uh, pick a track from an album by an, an American group called Lawrence. Do any of you know Lawrence? Okay, well, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a couple of siblings 
Gracie and Clyde, and they write essentially uh, soul and R&B type music, and they're very young, um, and they're on, they're just outstanding. So uh, I've been listening to a lot of them over the, the course of the past couple of years, and I thought I'd just pick something by them. So let's see if this is going to work. Orange, we're working. Okay, so there'll be some hits and misses in this, and I might say this is, in fact, how I practice. Um, there was a time when I did tons of scales and Daffinal Gobert and all that stuff, but I don't do any technicals. I don't practice scales, I don't practice long tones. What you're gonna watch me do right now is how I practice, because I'm interested in improvising and cultivating my ear. I admit, being on the road for the first time, I, I was in the hotel room and I, I did some technicals, which I never ever do, but, uh, but this is really how I practice. So let's see if I can get this to happen. Figure out the key first, so it's E flat. and misses there. There are a few things that I might say is, first of all, I'm playing way too much. If I were actually in the studio addressing that track, I'd be playing a lot less. And I was also doing a fair measure of extemporizing, because ordinarily what I actually try and do is 
match whatever they're doing, note for note, even if I'm a little late in doing so. So if I just, like, just gave you an example. So just advance the track a little bit. So. So that might be a little more realistic in terms of what I do when I'm practicing. I'm actually trying to play what I'm hearing. So I'm trying to mimic the vocalist, or I might hear a horn line and catch that. Sometimes I'm behind because I don't know what they're going to do, or it's a track I've never heard. So I actually have to wait, I have to hear it, and then see if I can work the phrase in. But that's, that's sort of a, a little bit about what I do. and how I practice, so maybe I'll just shut this down so you just and ask you some questions. Like that. Okay, sorry? So you just pick it up like the flute and well, let's get started playing for the day and you move right to something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I do. Whatever, whatever I'm listening to, I practice with. It could be anything. It could be bebop, it could be this. Uh, um, there's some choral work that I really like and that's very, what's the word? Well, it's very sort of sacred as opposed to secular. And um, yeah, just whatever I'm, I don't really sit down and listen to music. I'm always playing with it. Bill, do you ever do long tones? No. Like, no? Nope. Never do long tones, never do scales. I haven't done them for years. Although, as I say, I, today I did a, f a few technicals. And um, when I do, um, do you know what this is? <laughs> OK. I'll tell you right now, what, one of the reasons I'm a good player is my time is good. And that comes from doing this since childhood. So quite frankly, um, when I was practicing, whenever I'm, pra I, I, as I say, I play with uh, tracks now, so that's the rhythm. But when you're practicing, if you're not working with your metronome, you're not practicing, plain and simple. So make sure, the only thing you don't need a metronome for is long tones. Uh, but if you're doing scales, technicals, etudes, studies, or you're working on licks, or you're working on a tune uh, that you're trying to learn, uh, trying to get the melody under control or what have you, the metronome had better be going. Because you really want to learn how to lock in with the time. Um, time is an interesting aspect of, uh, of um, music in general, but it, it's I come from a classical tradition, but uh, when I started to improvise, everyone was playing bebop, so I had to sort of learn how to do that. Um, but the, the, the approach to time was, was quite a bit different. And uh, the nice thing about learning how to improvise and having to understand music better was it brought me a lot closer to music than I ever was as a classical player. Uh, because in order to improvise on a tune, you have to really understand what is going on. Um, you, can't, you can't fake it. Um, so one of the aspects that's really, really important is time. And uh, the, the key things are to really understand the quarter beat. And I mean that in a very profound kind of way, like understanding clearly where the quarter beat starts and where it stops, and having that firmly ingrained. And the only way you have a fighting chance of doing that, as I say, is starting to work with the metronome and making sure that you're locking in with the metronome. Uh, and then, of course, you want to be able to subdivide the time very, very precisely. So into eights, triplets, and sixteenths, for example. So for, I'll, I'll give you a simple illustration. Um, I, I may not get you guys to do this because it'll just get a little chaotic. But if I just turn on the metronome, and you notice the instrument's on the table. 
I'm not even thinking about playing. I'm thinking about time and how, how it feels and how I can connect with it. So if I just set the metronome at a, you know, a, a unchallenging um, tempo, maybe even slower. As a jazz player, I like to hear the metronome on two and four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and clap with the metronome on two and four. So I'll, I'll just try this and see what happens. One, two, one, two. That is not an idle exercise. As plain and simple as it is, it's not that easy to do. Now, did you notice anything about what was going on when I was clapping with the metronome? Good or bad? The wavering with it, and I saw you grimacing when you were. Right, good, good point. So I'm, I'm listening very closely, and it's hard to get it placed squarely. So you have to really be humble about your relationship to that quarter beat. You're feeling it, not thinking it? Uh, it I'm coming to that. Yeah. You're getting a little ahead of me. I want you to, so that's, that's when it's not good. What about when it's good? What happens? You don't hear the click. Exactly. You, all of a sudden, the metronome starts to vanish, starts to disappear. And then, you, then now, I, now I'm going to address your point, is that's, that means you're almost there. Because the other thing that you have to do is get to the point where you're totally connected to that quarter beat. And the sensation that you will have with that little exercise, if you do it correctly, is this. First, you'll minimize those waivers or flaws. You will start to connect with the metronome and not hear it. And also, once you really internalize it, you'll get the sensation that it's slowing down. And it's not because it's a metronome. And when you get to that point, you've arrived. You really understand the quarter beat. So you can take that home as a bit of an exercise. As I say, it's relevant to any instrumentalist. But um, now the other thing about, uh, about the way you've, you sense the quarter beat is, you know, they talk about swing. And it's actually a good idea to try and visualize the quarter beat as a swing pattern, um, and literally as a pendulum. So think of what the pendulum does, because it's not, you know, it's not that at all. It's got this. Just the way the pendulum swings. And understanding the quarter beat in that sense, this is much more subtle, and that's where you start to, you have to really, really feel it. That will enable you to, uh, really start to connect with, say, a drummer. And once that synergy starts happening, then boom, the audience will start to sense, what is going on there? And it's very, very simple. Because if your time is misplaced, or um, it's not secure or stable, or it doesn't have some of those more subtle components, like that aspect of pendulum, it doesn't matter how beautiful your lines are. They're not going to connect. It doesn't matter how beautiful your lines are. So that's a little bit about time and the quarter beat. I cover, a lot of these things are covered, at least in some measure, in the book anyway. And that would be under theory, uh, rhythm, the first thing. Um, just trying to think on that track. What's interesting is that track is not even eights, right? What I was just playing there, like if I just play some more of it. Do you want to hear any more of it? or? Or have you got the idea? Maybe I'll see if I can do something wrong. And, and where is it now? Like, I don't know if I can necessarily do it wrong, but.
see the lines are not bad, and the time is pretty. The time is pretty good, but it's still sort of like, it's when you get this thing happening. If you notice what I did there, but the other thing is, is I don't necessarily think about playing everything or all the beats. So often players, especially when they're lesser players, they're going to do the obvious things. So that means they're going to be after those down beats, and it's a cadence. They bang, they bang one at the start of the next cadence. Well, if you just leave the one to the rhythm section, like you move right into it and stop short of it and let the rhythm section handle it. It's like, oh, and that's what happens. I get people get reacting, how do you do that? Well, I'm, it's the, the, the part of the trick in music is we all tend to want to play and be doing things. And the, the way of getting a musical result is often not a process of addition, but a process of subtraction. So this is an interesting thing. It's like, if I do that, I'll, I'll just dem demonstrate this little point. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. Why am I not hearing anything? what people want to do. Well, watch this. See what's happening? All of a sudden, it has this funny kind of levity. And it's not because I'm playing it, it's because I'm not playing it. I'm choosing not to play in very strategic spots. Leave it to the rhythm session. They're there anyway. And so if you let them, like, and then it sounds much more dynamic and interactive and much more interesting. And that's what happens. Musicians sometimes hear them, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's that simple. Not playing where you, where you most expect it. OK, so that's a lot about. Uh, Rhythm and, and time. Uh, I like to take the direction of the class, as it were. So, are there any other things that you'd like to know about? Something and, that go ahead. I was watching with you is when you're sort of going into your head and talking about, you know, if you don't play, uh, you know, I don't call it the pocket, I'll give it completely enough. Uh, on the beat, mm -hmm. you became very sort of rigid in the way you stamp, the way yeah, you stand. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And when you're really getting into it, there, you're, there's a lot of move. Like, yeah. how, how do you use your body with, with rhythm? Like, are you thinking about that? Or what's that, what's that mechanism? I'm yeah, that's, that's totally me. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not encouraging you to move that much. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you shouldn't. I mean, classical players would be like horrified. Mm -hmm. Uh, to watch that, so yeah. So um, the it's the way I feel music. Um, but if you watch someone like Hubert Loss, he doesn't move. He moves very little. And a lot of uh, flute players that I've, a lot of name brands, they don't they don't move very much. I move a lot. But technically, I mean, I always this is under control. Like that that relationship. No matter what my body's doing, that's that has to be in place. So I get a good strong sound. But the other thing is, I try not to stress about a lot of things, because um, improvising is, is a risky undertaking by nature. So you have to accept that um, uh, it's not just a question of things perhaps going wrong. You know that they're simply not going to go according to plan, because if, if it's planned, it's not really improvised. So, you, so this is, that's the thrill of the chase, is you know that's the nature of the undertaking. So you just go with it. And that means that you don't worry about like the occasional flaws or errors. People, people will not hear them if there's enough 
conviction and enough of the other basic elements are in place. Like if your time is strong, like right away, boom, you, uh, I can get them in the palm of my hand just with, with the time. Um, and sometimes uh, there are other things like, um, I don't know if I did that that much there, but for example, we're, the flute's tricky because you have to blow across this hole. So most people are making, they're making an effort to make noise on the instrument. And um, it's unfortunate because, uh, you know, you, ask, you hear a note and it's like, well, who cares? You know, really, I mean, like, who cares? So, you know, the first thing, uh, and I, t this is, I have to do this with virtually every student I've ever had, is the first thing is get rid of the vibrato. Just get rid of it. And for a while, don't use any. So that your ear starts to think, that is a perfectly legitimate sound. And that's your starting point. Simple, straight vibrato, or without vibrato. Um, when you're moving from classical to non-classical, that becomes really important because classical players typically lather their sound with vibrato, and they think that if you don't do that, it doesn't have color or something is missing, and it's all like nonsense. Again, it's one of those things where it's not, you don't have to do this. If you take it away, you're going to get more musical results. Um, because vibrato itself, it's a device. And by nature, it's distracting. So one of the themes in my book uh, is that melody is critical to everything you do. And in fact, it, it's the most important thing. It's more, far more important than the harmony. Far more important. And rest assured, I know lots about the harmony. I said it out here, too. But um, the, the melody is what is really critical. Because if you play a strong melody, that can imply a harmony. If you just play a bunch of chords, you don't hear a melody coming from that. QED, that's my point. That's like, if you play a strong melody, that can imply a harmony. If you play an, even a beautiful sequence of chords, it doesn't necessarily apply anything melodically. So the, the, the harmony is merely supportive. And in fact, all this, what do you call it? I get, I'm mildly dyslexic, so vertical and horizontal, which is which? The, the vertical aspects of music, which is essentially the harmony, they're all derived from the melody, the line. Everything, all harmony comes from a scale, all of it. And in fact, music, by its nature, and it doesn't matter what idiom you're considering. And rest assured, I've looked at a whole bunch of them. Um, all music is modal, period, period, period. I don't care how complex it gets harmonically. It's modal. So getting to understand your scales, understanding your modes, that's what's going to enable you um, to function melodically. Now, mind you, there's a lot of, I'm not saying that harmony is irrelevant. Um, and there's certain things that you can do when you've, when you've got a set of changes that will make your melodies, your melodies more coherent and so that they line up with what's going on underneath. But what's really important is having a strong melody. And if you, if you understand, like, say, the basic harmonic functions, like, for example, you know, I'm improvising there. I didn't know what key it was. I don't know what the changes are. I don't have a chart. Now, it's not too complicated, and that's another reason I'm going to suggest to you when you're trying to learn how to improvise. This kind of music is quite a, a rational and fun place to start, and it's not overly challenging. Like when I started, I wanted to play like Charlie Parker. Well, I can't pull down a Charlie P Parker record, and <laughs> good luck. Um, I had my ways of getting there, and for that, I would recommend the Omni book. But um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, uh, this kind of music. So, like, if uh, now, now you maybe you want to take your flutes out and maybe try something. I'll show you. If we take music like this, maybe I'll just pick another track here from from this album, whatever it is. Actually, if it's something you don't know, it might be. Hmm. 
why is it not advancing? I just wanted to advance the tracks. Just find out what else is on this album. Fi maybe find something a little slower. Okay, so this is slow. Do you want to try this, or do you... I'll try I'll just play a few tracks. Put your hands up when you hear something you, you won't like or you find interesting. They're taking too long to get into this. Okay. So what we'll do is just just play with this track a little bit. So, um, I've never heard it before necessarily. I've, I play with a lot of stuff. So what would I do on this in order to practice? Well, I'll play a little bit of it, and you tell me first of all what you have to do. So I know what the harmonies are already, but it doesn't matter. It's just, I'm, uh, uh, but what's the first thing you have to figure out? The key. Right, key. Do you know what key it's in? So you have to, you have to guess. You have to try and hum along to. Try, hum along to, but to, let's find the key. Someone find the key. I, I can tell you. I can do it for you if you like. It, just to move things along. I can save you a lot, some agony. E flat. E flat. E flat. It's in the E flat. Okay, now, because of the nature of this music, um, it's probably not gonna go through a lot of key areas. And um, I'll tell you right now, does anyone know what uh, scale or construct might work nicely in this situation? Just in principle. Don't know? Okay, I'll tell you, pentatonics. So you know what pentatonics are. So it's five notes, as opposed to a full seven. I'm, I might just digress on pentatonics to give you some insight into why they are so powerful. Because uh, I had a student from Britain once who said, I don't want to play pentatonics, and I, I want to do other stuff. <laughs> it was like his first lesson. So I said, stop right there. And I disabused him of that notion for the rest of the lesson. <laughs> and he came away, he came away converted, as it were. Um, but the pentatonic scale, you know, we often associate it with oriental. You know, that kind of nonsense. Um, but the fact of the matter is that construct, that melodic construct, is present in all idioms from east to west. And it's also present throughout time, whether it's modern, ancient, or even whatever's going to happen next. And why would that be? Well, if you, uh, if you take the black notes on a piano, okay, uh, like you all know that, right? Yeah. It's a knuckle song, so it's all the black notes. Now, what's interesting about that is it's a pentatonic, and the beauty of it is that it's a melodic pentatonic going up, and it's a minor or a, what you, a major pentatonic going up, and a minor pentatonic going down. And the relationship between uh, major and minor pentatonics is just like they are with the ordinary scale. So uh, and, uh, you can try and play along with this. Uh, so just think of the black notes on the piano. So where does it start? So it starts on G flat. So that's the knuckle song. Now, this is, that's an ugly key signature because it happens to be G flat and a re related minor E flat. Um, but can you, it's five notes. So what's missing from the pentatonic scale? No, the third is there. Fourth is missing. 
And the seventh. And what are those two tones? Like I'll tell you, the, the thing to recognize is that it's the tritone. And that, uh, if we're in the key of G flat, means <laughs> means it's C flat and F that are missing, right? Should I take an easier key? You okay with this? Okay. The main thing to recognize is that the fourth and the seventh, that dissonance, is not there in the, in the G flat pentatonic scale. OK. Now, now you, you're starting to see why this is so powerful, is because it means that it's all consonant. There's no dissonance. The tritone is absent. So there's no dissonance, which means you can play that scale in any sequence. You can play the notes in any order on the piano, and it will all sound sort of pleasing, and it won't, it won't jar you. In fact, it's such that if you just put your arm on all of those notes, it sounds OK. That's very powerful melodically. And that's why so much um, of any of the music that you're listening to, it's going to have pent pentatonics in there somewhere. Now, there's something else that's really important about a pentatonic scale. When you're improvising, you know, uh, all the theory says you have to know all these scales and you have to know all these chords. So that implies you have to know uh, seven notes. And you also have to be able to arpeggiate them, preferably in sevenths, because non-classical music typically is not triads. So you should work your arpeggios in sevenths. Um, and when you're improvising, in a sense, you only have, I mean, you can't reinvent the wheel. Most of what you're doing is going to be a function of the relevant scales or the relevant arpeggios. And, and that's it. And you might mix and match them a, a little bit and pick fragments and stuff. But at the end of the day, you're just playing scales and or arpeggios. That's it. But now let's look at the pentatonic, because it's got five notes. Another powerful aspect of the pentatonic is that we think of it as a scale, but the fact that there, those, that interval is missing, it gives it this quality of being an arpeggio at the same time. So it's not just. You know, it's not just a, a bunch of scales. It's got, and the, uh, the arpeggios. So it's got both those things happening. And it's completely consonant. And that's important because when you're playing, you want to, your, your, your points of consonance are your first points of reference. Usually um, players that get more advanced, they're trying to find the other stuff that's going on. Well, you just, you know, you're going to stress yourself out. And there's a good chance the audience won't even care what you're doing and may not even like it because you're trying to go, you're looking for all the substitutions and all the alterations and all the extensions. Well, yeah, you can use those and I, I use them myself. But if you're fixated on that, you're going to lose sight of what's really important, which is something simple like a pentatonic. <laughs> It'll save your butt in so many situations. Now, the pentatonic scale, uh, I should have paused there just to let that sink in. So if you got it, think about it now. The pentatonic, it's completely melodic. There is no dissonance. And also, because it's missing notes, it's got the quality of an arpeggio and a scale all at once. So bang. Those are powerful things to rely on when you're trying to make music. Now, you can't, lose, you can't use them exclusively, because that's what it ends up sounding like. You know, it just gets a little boring. And there, so you start looking for maybe some other pentatonics that might fit that key area, that are consonant with that key area. And there are more than one pentatonic that will fit in a given key area. Um, I won't go into that in great depth. I think if you just start to recognize that the pentatonic is, uh, 
is really, really important. That's sufficient at this, at this stage. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, you notice, did you detect any trouble with me playing the G flat pentatonic scale? No, because I practiced it. I practiced it to death. So I know, I know what G flat pentatonic, I, I don't care that there are six flats, I really don't. And this is also an important uh, way to approach your technicals, which I didn't learn until later. Although maybe I just learned it as I was going along, but I'll give you this insight right now. When you're practicing your technicals and your scales and you're, le and you're working them through different key areas, uh, one thing that's a good idea is don't use music. Try and do it without music. Now, if you have to initially, that's okay. But get to the point where you're not doing it. And it's not hard to do that, because even if it's the G-flat major scale, you know what happens? You're going Everyone, I've been through this. I know what it feels like. So you're getting it all wrong. And then after a while, you go I've got it, OK. And that's what happens. And that's what you want to do, is you want to get it under your fingers and get your synapses to know exactly what that key area feels like, so that you're not thinking about the key signature. And it also means that if the key signature gets difficult, it's like, so what? It's just a key signature. I'm in that key area. Away I go. And I know it feels like this, literally. That's really important when you're improvising in real time. And we'll, we'll do that with this piece shortly. I'm telling you a whole bunch of things that, are, that underlie this uh, uh, so, sort of like the way to think about things and the way to approach things. So when, when I'm improvising, um, I'm often, I really, I, I either don't know the changes or I just don't care about them. Because if I've got the key area, I've got, you know, like a lot of ground covered. So I know what the key area feels like. And if I can hear the key area, bang. I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. And I don't worry about, even if I see a complex chord chart, uh, I don't worry about the alterations and the extensions and the substitutions, because I'm looking at it functionally. I'm saying, is it a 2-5-1 in major or minor, or is it unresolved 2-5, or what's, and is it, is it major or, or minor? I'm, just, I'm thinking very broadly, and basically, what key area am I in? That's it. So now we'll get back to the track here. And we figured out that it's in the key of E flat. Thank you. Now that, that, then the question is, yeah. OK, so now that the ne next thing is key area. So we, we say, OK, pentatonic is irrelevant. Now which is it, major or minor? Based on what we're hearing, what is that? Well, it's bluesy, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that's going to work. So what's interesting about the pentatonic, and another reason why it's so powerful and so potent is, guess what the blues scale is? It's a pentatonic minor with one additional note, and that's it. So that's like, and what's also interesting about this track we just happened to stumble on is, what key is it in? E flat. E flat. So E flat. That was the minor pentatonic on the knuckle song. So we've already got that under our fingers. Remember what I was saying earlier? Get to know what the key area feels like. So just get your fingers wrapped around the E flat minor pentatonic scale. Just. It's really funny. I guess I've never done that with a class because what's interesting is, remember what I was saying, Peter, you're struggling with the, the key signature and all that junk, and it sounds, it might sound terrible at first. I listen to all of you, and of course it starts off that way. You're like, oh, gee. But then after a while, people are starting to get, you know, all got the notes, and all of a sudden, remember what I was saying, it all starts to sound melodic and very pretty, and it's like all uh, keys down, and it sounds cool, it's, and it's okay. Boom. So you're already starting to make some melodic sense. 
without trying too hard and without thinking too much. You, you, you want to save your, your brain for something else. <laughs> Could be anything else. In, in, in a musical framework, really what you, it, it, it is funny and it is true, but if you want to save it for anything, you have to save your, 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 your resources for things that are really important, like what's the rest of the band doing, or how do I feel, or how does, what sounds, what sound am I looking after, or seeking here? Um, uh, and often that, you don't want to be intellectualizing too much. That's why it's really important to know first key area and secondly which pentatonic might be apical because this is a very narrow way of looking at the tune but it's you're going to be able to start music start to make music with doing this. Um, we know the uh, it's blues so so we know that scale is going to work and if you add the blue note See how fast I can do that without, uh, without practicing scales, <laughs> or pentatonics for that matter. Um, did you want to run the E-flat pentatonic with the A natural to make sure you know what that feels like too? Yeah, just, just, just do the same thing you did before. Just play the, it's the E-flat pentat minor pentatonic, but with the A now. Enough. I can't take anymore. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing because with this one now, you've got the A natural, which means you've got some dissonance. So it'll never, it'll never uh, sort of settle into that groove that the other scale did, where it was all pure pentatonic. All right, so you know that this, th that scale is going to work. Now, what's other, I, I've got to, got to let you in on something, is that the blue scale will work, but wait a second, just listen to this some more, just a little more. Told you not to play with that fire But you just had to give it a taste And I'm trying to be a friend But I fear I just will end But don't say I didn't warn you when you sweat it What's the third? Did anyone hear? Were you paying attention? What's the third? They're in E flat. Exactly, it's major. Now, that's another sort of mystery of the blues, which is this. The blues is essentially simultaneously major and minor, and there is no other idiom like that. No other idiom at all. It's simultaneously major and minor. Now, mind you, the blues is a big area, and there are lots of forms and so forth, and this is, this is actually a, a minor blues form, I, we won't worry about all this stuff. What's more important to recognize is that the blues, in the most fundamental sense, is simultaneously major and minor. So what does that mean melodically now about what we're going to do? We just played the E-flat minor pentatonic, so? Then it's E-flat major pentatonic? Exactly. You've got potential to work the E-flat, so let's work the E-flat, let's figure out what the notes are for the E-flat major pentatonic. So what are they? Right. So, so you want to you maybe maybe want to get those notes under your fingers too. The E flat major pentatonic now. You got it. You got it. Now let's just, just for practice, we'll do the, the minor, um, and, and we'll leave out that, uh, that blue note, just because we want to, so do the E flat, because we know that one's somewhere, it's buried in there. So let's just do the E flat, E flat minor too. Just get that under your fingers. Okay, that's good enough. So, um, qu quite frankly, I often just 
think in terms of maybe one pentatonic and maybe invoke the other one. I'm not sure how to approach this tune because, as I say, the, uh, it's it's very funky and bluesy, which means the potential is there for both. Um, do you want to listen to me play a little a little bit along with this, and maybe I can try and figure out what I might do, uh, and then I'll get you guys to do because I I don't want you thinking too hard, but I want you to recognize before we settle on anything that. Pentatonics are really important. They come in major and minor forms. And from the minor, the blues scale comes. And uh, they're very powerful melodically because they're consonant. There's no dissonance in them, which means they're going to fit everywhere. And they have this aspect of scale and arpeggio, which gives, gives things a nice shape and contour, different from a straight scale or a straight arpeggio. And uh, OK, let me just see. Tonic oriented, but I'm actually sort of changing ground between major and minor. The main and the, the main distinctive uh, melodic aspect is the uh, the third, and because it's blues oriented, it means you can get away with both. You don't have to feel oh, it's, I got to play the blues, I got to play that G flat all the time. No, 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 you can play the G natural. It'll be totally cool. So I, I think I was gravitating towards the major pentatonic there, just instinctively. Let me just. Tell me not to worry about it. If I just use the minor. Switch to major now, so you can listen. That's largely major. Now I switch to minor. And I switch to major. See what I did? See what I did there? Because I was playing minor all of a sudden, bang, I hit natural G. It sounds perfectly OK. So if you want to take a run at this, you can try one or the other. Or you can try one, then move into the other. Or if you're feeling very skilled and you're anywhere near my level, <laughs> then, you can, <laughs> then, you, then you can try both like I was doing there. Because I, I, I actually, I'm very spontaneous. I don't even. I don't even intellectualize or think about it. Um, but watch how much music you can make. So we'll let the track run a little bit now. So as I say, just decide for yourselves, are you going to do major or minor, or maybe work one for a bit and then the other? Here we go. It's E flat. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The rhythm break here. Good. Some other things that you can do is um, uh, how did that feel? Did you feel like you were getting somewhere? Of course you were. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, the other thing is sometimes play like not too much, or as I say, ideally you should just imitate the vocalist. These these are really nice vocalists, the two of them. Um, but maybe just uh, think very sparse. So watch this. <laughs> Right. 
So when they start to wail there, you can just find a note and we just, and there you might want to put in some vibrato. Because <laughs> actually, that's a good point. I'm using no vibrato there, none. Absolutely none, because I want my melody, my, I want my line to be very clear, unadulterated, and without the distraction of any vibrato, so you really hear the line. And then as I say, like, and the, vocal, the vocalists do that too. And at those strategic points, that's the other thing, is the way I look at sound, there's lots of possibilities. As I say, it's not, it's not like that at all. I hear, All of that's relevant. All of that can be musically relevant, and I don't dismiss it. And especially the end there is just some wind breaking in against the back, the back wall. People go, oh, oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's good enough for Ben Webster, you know, and that's the way you look at things. You start to look at all the possibilities because it makes it much more dynamic. This is the other thing I was going to say about vibrato is that uh, it's a legitimate concern that maybe things will lack color, um, but vibrato is not the answer. And vibrato can uh, uh, detract from the overall musical result. Even though you think you're making it better, you're not. You're getting in the way, especially of the melody. So what can you do as an alternative? It's very simple, and you, you saw me doing a lot of it here, which is compresses and swells. It's the way you handle your air column. It's very different from a classical player. So classical players, I mean, often they're, de they're dealing with whatever is before them, the whatever the music says. So, They've got their crescendos and their decrescendos, and often things are, uh, changes in volume are taking place over uh, sort of longer intervals of time. As soon as you get into non-classical music, there's a number of things that come into play. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to go back to rhythm, but just forgive me. Um, uh, first of all, the, the points of relevance and interest and emphasis in non-classical music are different from classical. Um, Classical is sort of, uh, it, it's, it's looking for stable points in the time. So it means they always, it's like one and three of the four beats, and the downbeats all the way along. So that's where, what is it? Whatever, whatever the notes are. But you see what I'm saying? It's all downbeat oriented, okay? When you move to non-classical, all of a sudden, what's relevant? Not the one and the three, the two and the four. And they're easy to pinpoint because, you know, in, in jazz or swing, it's a sock symbol. In rock music, which is even eights now, um, it's the backbeat on the snare. And so much rock music has, has, has that. I mean, if you just take the stones, is there, is there any tune they do where Charlie Watts isn't doing, doing the backbeat on tune four? I mean, it's so obvious. Um, but in any event, what I want you to recognize is that they're not thinking about one and three, they're thinking about two and four, and, they're, and everyone's also starting to think upbeats are relevant, not downbeats, because that's what levitates the time. So these are important things to recognize. Now, I, I deviated from time because what was I talking about? Vibrato. Vibrato? Air column. Okay, air column. That's it. Bingo. That's what I wanted to hear. That got me back on course. So with, with non-classical music, all of a sudden you have to handle your air column uh, very, very differently. Um, uh, I'm sort of an interesting bird because uh, I improvise, but I do not use extended techniques. I came from a classical tradition, and I had to figure that stuff out on my own. But um, what, I, what I'm doing, I'm still working this instrument in its its fundamental acoustic way, uh, but I'm looking at it differently, and this comes from soul singers, a lot of it, is getting to manipulate the air column in a much more um, uh, dynamic way. So, um, and, and, and even if you're playing swing or shuffle, like now the air column, it's not, it's not a continuous stream at all, it's bouncing, and it's pushing on the upbeats. So like if you just take a, a simple, I don't know, a shout figure or something. Notice I only use vibrato on the last note and I'm coming to that. Um, so what was happening there? Like ordinarily people might
that's fine, you know, there's nothing wrong, the notes are right, it's sort of metronomic, but but nothing is happening. That, that's, this is a horse of a different color now. I'm just horsing around there, playing anything. But what I'm doing is I'm working the air column, and I'm tending to put uh, like huffs, little huffs of air on the upbeats to give it that sort of levity and, and bounce. And I'm thinking quarter beats, um, and uh, happen to be breaking it down to alter triplets, that's the other thing, where you place it, because that starts to tie in with the pendulum. Remember what I was saying, is you want, the, it's a very hard thing to describe, I'm telling you guys. You, you ultimately have to work it and feel it. But um, uh, the main thing is to, um, like, So that, that's got a whole different feel because of the way the air column is being handled and also where the notes are being placed relative to the quarter beat because I know exactly where it begins, where it ends. And often, I'm, I'm trying to figure a way to describe this about time. It's, a, it, it's tricky. People often are trying to make the time. You know, they're trying to make the pulse happen. And really what you should be doing is recognize the time is there and you're sort of catching this wave. So there's much less stress or energy involved in doing it. Like you're just catching this wave. Do you want to try some more work on this? Are you, are, are you running out of questions? I haven't run out of things to say. <laughs> just, just for time, you're running just so, like what, an hour and 15, just to give you a sense yep. of okay. where you're at. And I don't know if people have questions or things they might want to just like, Yeah, that's why I'm here. If you have questions. Anything. Exactly. Like we're playing at the Yardbird Suite tomorrow night. I wanted to put that out there. So please, please. This is Jeremy Price, uh, the vibe yeah. colleague Bill <laughs> in our. This is just somebody I, I lucked out and I found him several years ago uh, in Toronto. Uh, but it was through Paul Fleming, actually, that yeah, I learned right. about you. And uh, uh, I have a different journey on the flute, but self taught and, I mean, I don't know what, what, what to say. Just, I feel we're really lucky to have him here and, uh, and share his, uh, his journey and um, his, his uh, approach. Because I think with flute, I mean, everyone has different shaped fingers, has a different shaped jaw. Uh, there's a lot of individuality to the instrument, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, I mean, you put in your time. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I. I just wish <laughs> it's always nice to wish we could play what we hear sometimes. But if we put in as much time and it becomes as natural as just breathing. Um, I, I'm not digressing a bit, but I mean, I I feel like the most natural way is probably the best way. Um, like so, if you feel like you're struggling with something or back away from it maybe a little bit or just try a different you know like I mean Bill I don't know how you, when you started when you were young with the yeah. flute getting just trying to get your sound trying well, to get like this yeah that might be a different yeah exactly like, that might be interesting for me to comment on sound. Um, uh, as I say I grew up in a small town uh, so there really wasn't much music happening there was a little bit and I try and uh, I try and take part in the Port Colborne Recreation Commission band and uh, the high school orchestras and stuff, but uh, and the, and the teachers were not very good either, really. Um, and I started on the piano and gave up very quickly, um, which was a pity because I really like music. And I think the reason I did that was I, I just didn't like the piano teacher. Um, so I asked for a, f a flute, and what I really wanted was a recorder, like the guy had in the in the in the cab. I didn't know what it was called exactly, so I, I asked for a flute, and I got one. 
<laughs> and I, I, I'm making laugh because my my father, uh, you know, took me at my word, my, and my mom, and they found a flute for me, and they had the teacher bring it over to the house, and uh, so they were opening the case, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, uh, uh, and I'm just thinking, what's going on here? This is metal. It's not. It's not wood. And then I, there's all these keys and mechanism on it, and they're going, "What the? What, what's, what's all that nonsense?" And uh, so I mean, I was very perplexed right from the start. And then of course they put it together, okay? <laughs> and you know it was kind of long, and uh, and then they wanted me to try and blow it, and they're putting it like this way, and I went. What, what? And I'm telling you, I was so frustrated, and I thought, this is, this is some kind of terrible mistake. <laughs> but you didn't mess with my old man. So I knew he'd gone to the trouble of doing what I asked. And uh, so I thought, well, I guess I'm going to have to start practicing this thing. And that was what was very peculiar, was as soon as I started practicing, boom, it was like a duck to water. And you couldn't stop me from practicing. And uh, I didn't expect that myself, as I say, because I was so frustrated and uh, perplexed by the, the instrument initially. And um, so I grew up in a small town, and I was really, really completely driven by the instrument. And, and I was lucky as well, because I, I, I was very young, and I, I, I learned how to focus on something, like really focus on it. And, exercise patience and trying to wrestle with it and get it under control. And I was prepared to do that. I was kind of nerdy. Um, I've forgotten when I had my first girlfriend, but it was a long time coming. Anyway, so <laughs> anyway, I would practice with the metronome and I'd work my scales and sometimes the teachers would say, oh, that's very good. And I just think, hmm. I didn't say anything, but I just think, no, it's not very good. I can do that better. I'd go home and just, just work and work on scales. And just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, because I, I don't know which 10,000 hours I'm on, but uh, it's like, uh, if I... If I just play that, okay, it's a D major scale. It's lightning fast, and you can hear every note. So just... So, where does that come from? It comes from... That was pretty bad. I'd be working on that a lot more. But you see what I'm driving at? And I never practiced fast, ever. Speed comes. Don't worry about it. Speed comes. But uh, Parts of that were not bad. But um, I don't do that anymore. I just rely on my synapses. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, I. I uh, I was very dedicated to the instrument, and it enabled me to, uh, or I learned how to focus on something and exercise patience about, get, uh, about wrestling with it. And actually, that served me well, because I had another discipline in life. And what, was, what, what happened was, everything I'd learned about music, boom, I just rechanneled into this other thing. So that's what I'm saying. I was very lucky to get something happening like that uh, at such an early age. And um, anyway. Uh, I was studying with Robert Aiken by the time I was in high school, and he had nothing but performance majors. I was coming from Port Coburn to Toronto for, for lessons, and he was sitting me down after about the second lesson saying, Bill, I think you should go into a career in performance. And, uh, and I was thinking about that. But I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm glad I didn't go into classical music because it, it was, it sort of, it, especially when I started to improvise it, that, I, I sensed the constraint I was experiencing as a classical player because if you play everything written and you execute it properly, then you're away to the races. But I didn't want to execute music. I wanted to bring it to life. And improvising sort of enabled me to do that. And when I decided to make that transition, which was in my 20s, um, I essentially had to start all over again. It was very sort of difficult because, as I indicated, my, I had good technique, I had good sound, but it wasn't working. 
in a non-classical situation. So I had to modify my technique without altering it and getting rad, because I wasn't interested in that. I, I still love the sound of the flute, and I wanted to make sure that was clear. So I, I learned how to modify my technique um, in the things, the sort of things that I talk about in the first part there. And there's not that many elements, really. It's not that big a deal. Um, but you do have to uh, modify your technique so it will function better in non-classical situations. So I had to wrestle with that, but also, all of a sudden, you know, there's no music, so now what am I going to play? So I had to learn some theory. I really had to learn some theory. Um, and that was a whole different thing. So as I say, I, I, was, a, I was a really, you know, relatively accomplished flute player, and then when I started to improvise, I had to, to start over on the instrument and, of course, understanding music in a way that I'd never understood it before. Um, and um, I came to Toronto from, like, basically, I, uh, we were, I had teachers. As I got better, my old man would, would uh, succumb and get me better teachers. So I started in Port Colborne, then Wellham, then St. Catharines, and I was studying with Robert in Toronto by grade nine. Um, when I started to improvise, I read a lot, and I had maybe one or two good teachers. There was one guy, Frank Falco, in Toronto, who really helped me a lot, and he walked me through all of those basic uh, um, vertical, harmonic, uh, 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 vertical and horizontal relationships in music, so I could sort of understand. He couldn't help me with the technique, of course. He was a piano player. Um, the technique I had to figure out on my own, because even Robert didn't know what, you know, that's, that's not his thing, playing bebop on the flute or what have you. So uh, I was definitely on my own. But I figured out, because as I say, from childhood I've been very patient. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest to you is that uh, uh, I don't know which 10,000 hours I'm on. You may not have that kind of time. It doesn't matter. You know, like uh, my students, they, the, the thing is, it's a process and it's ongoing. And um, as I often say, like, we all struggle at our respective levels, and there's no shame in that. But what it does imply is this, is that you want to try and find a way of spending your time productively, and in some way that's directed. So you're listening to the right things, and you're approaching music in a, uh, a sensible way that will enable you to improvise, as opposed to just blowing into the instrument, wiggling your fingers, and sort of hoping for the best. That's not the way it works. You do have to think about it a bit and cultivate. Uh, I didn't, there's lots of things I could suggest to you, but uh, I, I gave you one sort of hint, like with the sound. Just playing a note and letting it diminish until it's gone and even past gone. And looking at sound that way, and looking at the instrument that way. And that comes from a lot of, basically, a lot of soul singers. Um, and that's why I also encourage flute players when they're learning to improvise, that music is accessible and it, it'll get you looking at your instrument differently because when you try and mimic that voice, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the instrument to speak like that. Uh, and once you do, there's, there's ways of, of going about it. But even if you just do it by imitation to the best of your ability with as much time as you have in the course of your day. I mean, uh, I've, I've, I've made a, now a career of this full time. Um, but I know what it's like when you're trying to do something else, or you've got a wife and kids, and uh, any, but you can still <coughs> accomplish something. And never, never worry about where you're at, because the temptation is, oh, they can play so much better, or I wish I could do that, or I'll never be able to do this. And <laughs> If you're focused, and you're patient, and you just make incremental progress, you'll get there. And if, even if you're not the best, it doesn't matter, you're better. That's the... Uh, that's the real objective, as I see it. Uh, anyway, so um, that's a little bit of uh, history from my standpoint, and just something I might say to those of you that are, uh, say, amateurs. I've been there. I know exactly what it feels like. I know the yearning to play better. And you can do it, but you do have to focus yourself. And maybe using some of the tricks that we're looking at today. So we know now, well, soul music, what can I do? Well. I could turn on the track, figure what key it's in, figure out the pentatonics that might apply, and typically it's a blues scale, and maybe the major pentatonic. Run those under your fingers. First, before you even start playing with the track, just get those things under your fingers, because you want to cultivate your synapses and not worry about the key. 
You just, you, all you want to know is that the key area feels and sounds like this. And come away with that. Because when you get into more complicated music, typically that's what happens. It's, it's, same, it's moving through several key areas. Well, I can, hear the, I can hear the key areas going by if it's not too complicated. And, uh, and when I do, I don't think about a key signature at all. I just reach for that key area because I know what it sounds and feels like. And that's where the, the fluency comes. And it takes a while to get there. But if you take the approach I'm suggesting today, you know, you, that, that sort of gets you on the path. That's for sure. All right, any, any other questions? Is, is that enough? Are you guys tired and fed up? No. Because I'll tell you anything. You can, I'll, uh, exactly, I'll tell you my innermost secrets, things you don't even want to know. Go ahead, we'll start with, uh, the, he had his hand up a little faster. Go ahead. I'm curious, you, you play Cuban music. Yes. I love Af Afro-Cuban. Yeah. Are you paying attention to the clave? Or Absolutely. You do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it's really hard to figure out it is. Is it three twos or two twos? It is. You know something? That's a, that's a whole other thing. I, I, <laughs> in my career, I mean, the, playing the flute, uh, I, I started on bebop, and that's what I sort of understood. Um, but as a flute player, uh, who was it? Memo Acevedo heard me playing, and he just, and he, and he wanted me in his band, like, right away. And he was the, the really heavy Latin uh, drummer percussionist in Toronto. Um, uh, so uh, I, mean, I was game for anything. It's improvising. I don't care. It's improvising, and I'm up for it. And and I was good enough. <laughs> so that, that, and he knew damn well I didn't know anything about Cuban music. <laughs> he knew it. And I remember because some gigs, I there's the, the, the fire in his eyes watching me. And uh, and uh, I'll just tell you a few stories along the way. So I, I, I remember myself, I, I, I confused and everything by the by the clave and all this stuff. And in fact, not even forget about the clave. As I said to Memo, I said, Memo, I, I just feel like I'm on some kind of rhythmic waterbed. I cannot get, I cannot find my place here. And Memo was simple. He says, Oh, listen to the bass player. So. I, I knew this much at that point, and I said, but Memo, <laughs> you know, even if it's salsa, you know, it's upbeats, and often it's nothing but upbeats. So how do you, I'm looking for points of stability, I, and I, I said I'm on a rhythm corner, how am I gonna, it's, he's playing upbeats, how, what the, and, and he, he's so funny, because he, he almost got mad at me, he says, Bill, listen to the bass player. <laughs> so I did, and boom. That resolved everything. It was the last thing I expected, was listening to the bass player play the upbeat somehow uh, secured me on this, what was formerly a rhythmic waterbed. Now the other thing is, the, the, there is a clave, um, and, uh, and that's kind of important. Um, uh, but you know, the way I see it, every idiom has a clave. You know, like swing is a clave. It's a very short one, but it's, it's a clave. And, uh, and a very important uh, uh, rhythmic element, uh, which is another sort of clave, is the Charleston figure, which we didn't get into today. Uh, that's really important. And that's a bit of a clave. And if you play any other idiom, like, uh, like for flute, of course, I'm getting calls, not for bebop, I'm getting calls for Latin and Brazilian. And those are just two strains of the Latin idiom, which is huge. And uh, Brazilian is quite big. It's, I, I can't, uh, can't do much about Brazilian in a situation like this, uh, or even Cuban. But Cuban is actually pretty simple. No Cuban would like to hear me say that. <laughs> they might even get mad at me. But the fact of the matter is, it's pretty simple. Um, now, that, I say that with, you know, based on considerable experience, too. I don't, I don't deny that. But, um, like, Cuban music is, it's all based on the clave, and they're different uh, grooves or bags, but they're often just distinguished by speed. That's the only thing. Like a cha-cha is slow, and a mambo is kind of upbeat, and a wahira has some uh, sort of cantabile vocal aspects to it. Uh, but it's all like sort of tempo-driven, because the clave is always there, so what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> So you, you do have to understand the clave, and there are certain things that, in my experience, I've noticed. Uh, for example, clave is very omnipresent, so it's in rock and roll, 
But what's interesting is the clave in rock and roll typically is forward. Clave is a three-two type pattern, um, and it's typically forward in rock music because rock music does like a little bit of stability. And the jazz stuff, the salsa stuff, typically it's, it's reverse clave, so it's 2-3 as opposed to 3-2. So I noticed that rock tends to be 3-2, and the, the jazz players tend to like 2-3 uh, because there's a bit of a swing element. In fact, there's a Charleston embedded in there. So uh, uh, those are, and I don't say those are, those are rules, it's just like certain tendencies that are very, very clear to me. Um, and getting to the point where you can distinguish the clave, that is tricky. And um, that does take some time. Uh, I, can, I can tell, like even in Toronto, we've got great players. In Toronto, actually, we have <laughs> unbelievable players on every instrument. Unbelievable players. But one thing I notice about the Latin crowd is, uh, you know, the, the horn players, for example, um, unless they're Cuban, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they can play the charts neat and clean, and then they get a soul, and boom, they bebop. And it's like, how rude. Because <laughs> I remember the first time I played Lula Lounge, I was subbing for a vibes player. They had this two trombone vibes uh, frontline format, and the vibes player couldn't make the gig. And he, and he told the leader about me, and he says, the flute parts are the same as the vibes parts, and the range is, he'll, 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 he'll be fine. So, so I went and did this, and I'd had some experience with Latin music at that point. These guys just didn't know me. It was the first time I played Lula Lounge. What was the band's name? Cachet. <laughs> But it was so funny because uh, uh, after the first set, they gave me a bunch of solos because they could, they could see I was like, I understood what was going on. <laughs> I, I understood what was going on. So I'm coming off the stand, and all these uh, la Latinos are sort of rushing up to me, speaking in Spanish, and they're, I didn't know what they were saying, but the guys in the band are with me, and I can see them going, no, no, no. And what was, what was going on was he saying, when did he come to Canada? Where, 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 when did he get here? <laughs> and, and, the guy, and the band guys are trying to say, he's not from, he's not from, he's from here. <laughs> so I fooled him. And, and I did sort of fool him. And I'll tell you, this is, and I, I, took, I covered this thing in the book too about idioms and the, the point that clave is, is, is an aspect of all music. It's not just Cuban music. All the, the clave is a difference. But that, that's the thing is you've got to find out what they are and then learn them, internalize them, and get them to the point where they sit right. Because it's not just being able to play a bossa nova. You know, it's, that's, people can do it, but it's stiff. The good players uh, listen to the folkloric music. That's often uh, when you're really trying to understand. So if, if you're taking bossa nova, for example, uh, bossa nova basically comes from samba. It's just a light samba groove. And the... Uh, I, I was uh, working with a really good percussionist in uh, in Toronto, and he was telling me something once about, uh, he was just showing me on a pandero, because that's sort of a basic uh, voice in samba, this pandero thing that they uh, rap. And he was, I'd never thought about it, but I learned a lot from what he told me, which is, um, this is the pattern, but you know, it's it's a little crooked. It's not, it's not, strictly like the metronome, boom. And that's what I try and work, no matter which idiom I'm pursuing, is I try and, and it, it ties in with that pendulum idea, which is common to all uh, uh, understanding of the chord note. But every element, doesn't matter whether it's tango or bossa or swing or shuffle or funk or R&B, or, everything's got its little clave and you have to figure out what is it and then get really close to it and internalize it. So the Cuban clave, admittedly, the 3-2 pattern, uh, it's not terribly complicated. Um, it's easy to write down and to actually just clap, say. Not, uh, but when it's happening in that, all that noise, sometimes it can be very hard to hear. It takes a while. It I, I know, it, even for me, it took me a while to get to the point where I know what the clave is, and I don't even think about it. I can feel it. And you have to, because when you're wrapping your lines around it, and that's the problem with the guys that bebop. So, but if you, and that's why I fooled the, the guys uh, in the club, is because I knew just enough, and I also listened to some, I'd actually listened to some Cuban flute players, so I knew some of the sort of melodic mannerisms, and I could, uh, 
I, I, I'm a jazzer, and so I'm not going to pretend I'm, I'm one of those guys. But I knew just enough I could, I could feel the stuff and find my place in this band. Come off the stage, and I, I fooled some, some natives. <laughs> so that's that's really important. Is, um, uh, coming to that understanding of the club, and that does take time. So you just be patient. But one thing I can recommend, uh, it's actually in the book, I think, too. Um, when, you're, when you're learning an idiom, and for Cuban, I can say this unequivocally. Uh, well, a actually, when you're learning any idiom, it's really important to listen to the folklore. And when I say I've, the folklore, I mean what's basic and what's uh, the, the country, the, con the countryside aspect of that music. Um, so for Cuban music, uh, it's Cuban rumba. And there's a really good band uh, that I listen to, uh, Los Moñaquitos de Matanzas. They've been around for 75 years or so. And um, they, uh, they, they uh, for Cuban rumba, actually, it's even a little bit narrower because they just have sort of three styles or three tempos. Remember what I was saying, Cuban music? It's all driven by tempo. So there's Wamonko and uh, Yambu and uh, something else. I forgot. It's probably a fast one. They also have a sacred version, which is where swing comes from, their uh, uh, Santeria. That's a whole other thing. And that, I, if you really want to understand swing, which a lot of people don't understand, if you listen to that Cuban Sant, um, Santeria swing, um, it's six eight, so you have to con so you have to sort of convert it to four in your brain. But that's where swing really comes from. In any event, for clave proper in Cuban music, listen to them. They are phenomenal, and they've been around for so long. Now that music is folkloric, and it's so folkloric that it's very African in, in orientation, which is understandable because slaves and. The fact of the matter is, a lot of Brazilian folkloric music has got African elements, slaves. So like if you study Cuban uh, folklore, you're starting to cover a few other bases, rest assured, which is, will serve you well. And if you, uh, things like Los Maniaquitos de Matanzas, I say the real distinguishing feature is just the tempos, and that's how they characterize the grooves, and there's only three of them. Uh, Colombia, that's the, the other one. Wawanko, Yambu, well, how is it? Yambu is the slowest, Wawanko is the next, and Colombian is the fastest. Um, and sometimes they overlap a little bit, uh, but broadly speaking, that's all there is to it. And their clave is always African, and it is always forward, and the tune always starts with the clave, and they take it from there at whatever tempo it happens to be. So it's also really refreshing. I mean, when I first heard these guys, uh, I was in my mid-40s, but that changed my whole concept of music, was hearing these guys. Um, and it's folkloric, it's African, so it's very raw. And uh, there's a lot of dance involved, too. You can probably find stuff on YouTube, um, but That's why I was able to fool these guys, is because I'd, I'd practice with, with Los Matanzas. And what's interesting about that band, this is the type of thing that made me look at music completely differently, is, uh, um, you know, what are, the, what are the things that we like as Westerners, and the music that we listen to, like, uh, especially kids, you know, what do they want to hear? They want to hear... Repetition. Yeah, repetition, but there's actually there's a lot of repetition. Any good idiom has repetition. There's, it's, it's an interesting aspect of music is like you, you, you have to, you need repetition. You, meet, you need certain elements to, to fit together so that, you, that are common to all the players so that you can play together. But you also want to vary them and give them, this, this is why this band is like amazing. Um, and even what's, uh, kids, they want to hear a lot of throbbing bass. And even sound guys and jazz gigs want to hear a lot of throbbing bass. I don't know where their <laughs> brains are. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of throbbing bass, and especially jazzers, oh, they want all those complex changes, and they want, they want things to do and things to happen. So we're like a complex set of changes, which doesn't imply any melody. It just means you uh, Anyway. So, Lismania Kitas de Matanzas, what does the band consist of?
voice and percussion. And that is it. There is nothing else. So all the things that we Westerners think are so important to the music, like a throbbing bass or a complex of changes or beautiful harmonies, that's not even part of the music. And it's the most profound music you will ever hear. It's just amazing. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to spell, too, but I'll pronounce it anyway. Los Muñequitas de Matanzas. So the last word, that's the city they live in, Matanzas. And the word uh, Muñequitas is dolls. So it, it tra sort of translates into the dolls from Matanzas. Um, and the band has been together, like I say, 75 years, and you, n no one ever quits the band. I mean, you become a member of the band, and you, you die with the band. And, and they all, they'll replace you when you die. Uh, so it's a little bit like a family. No, just, and, and that's one of the reasons. And they dance. And you can tell, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, and the dancing is fantastic, too. It's very, very subtle and um, uh, idiomatic. And uh, it's sort of like a, a, a soft break dance. It's very groovy. It's better than anything. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I'd rather watch that than as impressive as, you know, the Michael Jacksons and who are they, you know, those people can be. Uh, but actually, that's where they're coming from. <laughs> that's likely where they're coming from. So, um, so that's a really interesting, and I, I'm, I'm just suggesting them because one, they're folkloric, which means you're, li you're, hearing, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth and you're not hearing any other elements at play that might taint or distort it and distract you from what's really important. So you're hearing uh, the folklore and, uh, and you're hearing nothing but what's really important, which is what, what I hope you guys understood that I was stressing today is it's, it's melody and rhythm yes. and not harmony. I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but don't, don't get your, get your priorities straight. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Bill. I think yeah. that we're, we should probably... Yeah, it's probably not enough. Okay. <laughs> oh, can I take this one question if I can? No, we should drop off. Well, is it that big a question? I'm just saying, Bill, yeah. Is it that big a question? I just said, no, it's just a small question. <clears throat> okay. You can answer as long or as short as you want. <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when you're hearing into melody for the first time, you're trying to wrap your head around it. Right. Learn to understand it. Are you visualizing it? No. No. I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to see what it feels like. And I, I know I, I, I can catch the intervals and do, do a lot of stuff. Uh, it, here's a good illustration, too. I remember Bernie Sininsky, he's a great piano player. He was playing this, uh, he, he wanted to rehearse this sort of complex tune that I'd never heard before. And he writes some hard stuff. But this was very modal. He was called Pharaoh's something, I don't know. But uh, anyway. Um, we're at rehearsal, I'm looking at the chart, and, um, and he says, well, I'll play it for you. He's, he's got a recorder or something. And, and so he, he starts to play it, and I just start playing along with it, because I, you know, I, just, I just do my stuff. And then Bernie was like, do you know this tune? What, what's going on? I said, Bernie, I've never even heard it. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally, you know, like I'm, I'm doing what we did here today, sort of finding the key area and finding a few things, and I know what things sound and feel like. So. And I never visualize it. Uh, I never visualize it as if it were a manuscript. Um, yeah, I th that's yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, we do have copies of Bill's book available for purchase. If you would like to buy a copy tonight or have uh, Bill sign it, he's here. You're here. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and we do have some flutes from Haynes Flutes here. We have their Q series flutes. You are welcome to try. So while we're turning things down, do feel free to kind of hang out for a little bit if you haven't had a chance to have a look at the flutes. I'm here to. Uh, by the way, my name is Matthew. I work for Long Afraid. I, I know a bunch of you. Um, but I'm a flutist as well. Happy to answer any questions about the Haynes flutes as well. But thank you again, Bill. Yep. This was wonderful. This is an old Haynes, really old. <laughs> this is from like the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> but they're great instruments. I've got a newer one too, but. Anyway. Oh, and Yardbird tomorrow? What time? Tomorrow, right? tomorrow at 8. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 p.m. Yeah. Okay. With um, Chris Andrew. Chris Andrew. And Toledo and Jonathan McCaskill. Oh, awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's a good rhythm section. Yeah. Sure. Really good. Okay. Well, check it out. And thank you all for coming. We'll yep. see, thank you, you. Uh, see you here again. Yep. Thank you.